Hello, and welcome to the Alliance for Democracy's The Populist Dialogues. This Populist Dialogues Cablecast program's purpose is to advance the mission of the Alliance for Democracy to create a just society based on an equitable, sustainable economy. I'm your host, David Delk. Today we will broadcast video of Pulitzer Prize winning investigative journalist David K. Johnston, shot when he was in Portland recently speaking at the First Unitarian Church. David K. Johnston is author of three books on taxes and tax policy. His most recent book is The Fine Print, How Big Companies Use Plain English to Rob You Blind. And that was published last year. His topic here in Portland was Rise of the Monopolist, Why the Few Get Rich While Your Paycheck Shrinks. If you missed last week's broadcast of part one of his talk, you can see it at www.populistdialogues.org. Here's David K. Johnston. How many of you own a triple play package for internet, telephone, and cable? And you pay around without not the extras, forget the HBO and the dirty movies. 160 bucks a month for taxes, sound about right? That's the national average, $160. Well, it's too bad you don't live in uh, France, where they have competition. In France, your triple play package would cost you in American dollars 38 bucks. Oh, it's better than that. You get telephone calling to one foreign country, Canada, no extra charge. They get calls to 70 countries. You get American television. I mean, even if you want to watch the BBC, you got to watch BBC America. They get live television from all around the world. And their internet? It's 10 times faster downloading and 20 times faster uploading. And they're in, the, they're in the process of speeding up. I was in Seoul, South Korea last summer for Reuters, I still work for them, doing a column about the new trade agreement, the free trade agreement with South Korea, which President Obama said was going to create 169,000 jobs, and both countries will see an increase in goods and services traded between the two countries. Well, for the first eight months, the deal was in effect compared to the eight months of the previous year when it wasn't. Trade went up on both sides. Sales there went up, imports from there went up. And for every additional dollar of sales we made in South Korea, they made $25 billion dollar sales to us. And that's what's happened in all of these trade deals. When we made our not free trade, but liberal trade deal with China, we were told that the federal government said it might work out to be that it will be a little imbalanced. It might possibly be a billion dollars a year net loss to us to China. A billion dollars a year in this economy is not a big deal. Now it is a billion dollars a day. A day. We have lost 2.8 million factory jobs because of our trade deal with China. That's all the jobs in greater metropolitan Philadelphia, which takes in the northern tip of Delaware and South Jersey and a little piece of Maryland. 58,000 American factories have closed just because of China. But on the other hand, think about this, the most generous people in the history of the world are American factory workers because they voted for politicians who sacrificed their jobs so that the rural poor of China could have a decent life. Exactly what happened. It's a drop in standard living here, a rise of standard living there. You go to China, by the way, one of the things I go there every year to lecture once or twice a year for a week. And uh, one of the things that's very striking about all the big cities of China is beautiful roads, no potholes, incredible <laughs> buildings, unbelievably efficient, smooth subways. But last summer when I was in Seoul, South Korea, I was there to write a piece about trying to find an American car on the street. You know, Hyundai's now, or every ninth car sold in the U.S. is a Hyundai or a Kia. So I went to South Korea to see if I could find it. We spent three days driving around with a camera crew, and we found one Jeep. We found a bunch of Toyotas built in Maryland, or I'm sorry, in Ohio. Uh, we found a handful of other cars, because a fraction of 1% of the cars sold in that country are from the U.S., and for the next three years, four years when I was there, there's a tariff still on American cars to protect the South Korean car industry. 
Well, I met a young man, a Korean man, at the Hilton Hotel where I stayed, and he had come back from the U.S., and he said, you know, he says, your internet. I, I don't understand your internet. He was showing me how cool his cell phone was and how he could do all these things that my iPhone couldn't do and my BlackBerry that Reuters students couldn't do. And uh, he said, you know, I, I, in my hotel, I, I saw this ad. He just had this, uh, this bird. And they said, Roadrunner. He said, oh, yeah, Roadrunner, a wily coyote. And I said, yeah, Roadrunner, wily coyote. And he says, you know, at the end of this ad, they go, blazingly fast internet. What are they talking about? Because in South Korea, the internet is 200 times the speed of ours, and we pay 16 times what they pay for internet access. Everybody everywhere in South Korea has access to a super high-speed internet. When I do television, those of you who have seen me on CNN or PBS or MSNBC most often, I have to drive five miles from my house to the public station in Rochester, New York, or if I'm at Syracuse University teaching over to the studio the university has, and we go by satellite. Because Western New York, one of the biggest high-tech centers historically in America, is Rochester, New York, does not have an internet capable of supporting live television. So we go through a satellite. This makes sense because... Let me turn to another industry and what's going on. Insurance. If you have a job, your employer is supposed to have workers' compensation insurance. It is the legacy of the shirtwaist triangle factory where uh, over 100 young women who were locked in on a Saturday either burned to death or jumped out of the window so they wouldn't burn to death 100 years ago. And all the, the fire department lined up all the bodies on the street to make sure everybody saw this. Can you imagine a fire department doing that today? It would be, we're not, we're, caution viewers, picture you may not want to see. But the New York Fire Department said no. They lined up the bodies and they invited photographers to come and shoot pictures because they wanted people to see what had happened here. And the guy who was responsible, by the way, uh, he took most of the insurance money, he gave a little tiny bit to each of the families, kept the rest for himself, and a number of years later, once again, locked people in. Well, one of the legacies of that was workers' compensation insurance, and the idea that if something does go wrong, whether it's for good or bad reasons, doesn't matter, there'll be a claim paid, you'll be taken care of. Well, a man named Bob Manning called the New York Times one day, and people call the newspaper with all sorts of crazy things, you know, they, they're talking to people on Mars, and stuff like that, and so there's a nut phone. Every big newspaper at least had one as long as the 40 years I worked for newspapers. And the guy on the nut phone listened to this and thought about it and thought, this guy sounds like we ought to talk to him, and he refers him to me. And this man says to me, well, I'm paralyzed from the neck down. I can barely move a little bit of the fingers on one hand, and I'm trying to collect my workers' comp benefits. And this is in uh, the summer of 1997. And I said, well, okay. I said, they have to pay you. I mean, I wouldn't particularly worry about it. He says, well, I've been trying to collect since 1962. More than 30 orders by courts to pay. They wouldn't pay. We write a story about it. It runs on the front page of the New York Times. I call up. Uh, the next morning, that, or late that afternoon, I'm sorry, Governor Pataki, conservative Republican, calls me and says... We just had a cabinet meeting. I told my cabinet, they're going to pay this guy. And I told them, I don't care who gets hurt. Well, that's pretty powerful language. The governor in the gut state was a strong governor. I called the lawyer for the workers' comp company. who represents a bunch of big utilities, 18 big utilities. And he says, yeah. And I said, did you, did you listen to the quote I just gave you? And he goes, he's just a politician. The court hasn't really ordered us to pay anything. We report this the next day. The utility company is a little more politically sophisticated. They have another lawyer come in to look, and then they pay this man half of what they own. But then I find out that there's another trick going on, and this is the one that costs you a lot of money. People who are totally paralyzed often go to the hospital. Their autonomic nervous system doesn't work right. They have emergency room trips all the time. Sometimes they're in the hospital and things go really bad for months. They run a multi-million dollar hospital bills. 
So what this workers' comp insurance company does, and others have done, is they approve the admission to the hospital. The little wallet biopsy you get in the emergency room. They say, oh yeah, admit, admit Mr. Manning. And then when the bill comes, they refuse to pay. Well, the hospital just turns it over to Medicare, and you pay. So Bob Manning decided to sue. Well, the government has to give you permission to sue. They wouldn't give him permission to sue. They wouldn't give his lawyers permission to sue until I started calling around and asking, why don't you give him permermission to sue to protect the taxpayers? At this point, they gave him permission to sue. And the judge basically said, I don't want to hear this case. Why? Because we've reduced the number of federal judges. About a third of the federal judgeships are vacant. And judges don't have time for this stuff. And they finally were able to collect a little tiny portion of the money. And by the way, until the day that Bob died, they kept doing the same thing. They didn't change their behavior. So one day Bob calls me and he says, the insurance company asked me to die. Now my reaction is, oh boy, this guy, I mean, he's been 45 years at this point, paralyzed, he's going bad in his old age. And he says, no, no, he says, they sent a nurse. She ingratiated herself with my family and everything. She came to the house and, and I said, she asked you to die? And he says, well, she walked into my room and she looked on the wall and she said, why don't you have a DNR? You're supposed to have a DNR. You should have a DNR. And we get you a DNR. Most of you know what a DNR is. Do not resuscitate. Now, it's perfectly appropriate for you and your doctor to talk about having a DNR. My wife and I have certainly talked at length about these things. Because we should. It's our family business. But nobody with a financial interest in your life Nobody whose insurance carrier is owned by Warren Buffett should be doing this. Now, I'm positive Warren Buffett knew nothing about this, and I'm also positive that if he read my book, he is appalled, and that he would issue a directive, don't ever do that again. But I don't think his hands are clean. What does Warren Buffett say about the 81 businesses for which he has separate CEOs? 81. So long as my managers make their numbers, I let them run the companies as they see fit. Well, how do you make your numbers? You get a guy who's very expensive to keep alive, and you get him to die. That's how utterly immoral this is. Your cell phone. You have a choice of four cell phone companies in America, right? Basically, there's some other little providers. You go to Cricket, you know what? They just buy time off of the cell phone companies. Surplus time that they have. Have you noticed that all around the world, in India, Vietnam, Africa, people have cell phones? You think they pay what you pay? They pay very, very little. And they have some rules we don't have. Somebody calls you, you're not charged for a call to you. The person making the call pays. Not here in America. We're able to do that because we have laws passed that affect this. And those laws were written by the lobbyists for the cable companies and the telephone companies and the cell phone companies. Oh, I'm sorry, they're the same companies. <laughs> they are able to charge unbelievably high prices. Now, Wall Street has actually adopted all of this as a model. If my, those of you who bought my book or go to the library to get it later, you will see a long quote in my book from Morningstar, the financial advisory firm. And Morningstar says, if you're an investor, you should only buy the stocks of companies that have a moat. Now, of course, a moat normally means you've got a body of water around the castle, right, to make it kind of hard in medieval times and the Renaissance era and whatnot to attack the fort. But they mean by a moat, a set of regulatory rules and laws that make sure, no, make sure no one can, can compete against you. So imagine you said to yourself, you know, cable prices here are kind of high. Let's get my friends together. We'll raise some money. We'll start our own cable company. Of course, you're going to have to get PGE to let you string the cable or the city to let you dig up the streets to get a right away you don't have. And as soon as you do the first neighborhood, and you're going to have to start with one neighborhood, and you say, here's our price, it's 20% less, say, than uh, the current provider, they're just going to lower their price to half of yours. In fact, this happened in Sacramento, California. It happened in Scottsboro, Alabama. It happened in Glasgow, Kentucky. 
the monopolists can afford in one neighborhood or one city to lose a lot of money to protect their overall franchise and their high prices. They are extracting money from the economy. They are not building the economy. They are mining the body politic. They are also putting your life in danger. How many of you remember back in 1999 what happened at Whatcom Falls up in Bellingham, Washington? Any of you remember? There is, a, there is a gasoline and diesel fuel pipeline that follows the I-5. And the gasoline there is put in scalding hot temperatures because the hotter it is, the more viscous it is, and the quicker it moves, and under pressure. Well, the pipeline ruptured in Bellingham, and hundreds of thousands of gallons of hot fuel poured out. Two little boys doing what little boys do in the woods, were out playing with a butane cigarette lighter. Boom. The mayor called them unwitting heroes. Because if another 10 or 15 minutes had passed, the fuel would have been in downtown Bellingham, which if you've ever been there, the river curves around through downtown. And right at the edge of the river is a senior citizen's home with lots of old people, assisted living, and the jail, and the hotel. And all of those people would probably die. A year after that, in the desert of New Mexico, people were woken up by an explosion. Twenty miles away, it rattled the nose and woke people up. And when the firemen got there, there was this enormous blowtorch. The gas pipeline that goes from Texas to California, there's only one major gas pipeline had turned into this just enormous blow torch. And if you've ever been around a big fire, you know that the noise is just deafening. The firefighters were literally covering their hands and screaming orders in each other's ears. It took 90 minutes before they shut off the fire. And as soon as their ears cleared out and they could hear, which takes a little bit if you've ever been around a very loud noise, they suddenly heard wailing and crying. And they ran down to the Pecos River and they found 12, six people from a family of 12 that had been camping. And the first person they ran into begged to be shot to death. They were all dead within a couple of days. This family was camping about 680 feet from where the explosion took place, and it just was the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, the federal government has regulations about pipelines. And according to the federal government's official measure, a pipeline of this size, operating at two and a half times the pressure of this pipeline, which was 50 years old, would create a, what they call, high-consequence area. I call it a zone of virtually certain death. 650 feet away. These people were almost 700 feet away, and they were all burned. Now let's jump forward in time to two and a half years ago in San Bruno, California, the south of San Francisco. The California State Public Utility Commission staffer, whose job was to investigate whether pipelines in the state were safe, pulled into the driveway of her home, walked inside to see her daughter, and an entire city block went up. Same thing, flames 200 feet into the sky. It took Pacific Gas and Electric crews 90 minutes through rush hour traffic to get to where they needed to be to turn off the gas. Bad as that is, several weeks later, Mayor Jim Rowan told me, the city got a letter from PGE saying, PG&E, that they couldn't build a little structure they were going to put on a top lot where mothers take their kids in the daytime. Because there was another 55-year-old, 30-inch high-pressure pipeline running right underneath this top lot. The federal government has only been inspecting pipelines since 2002. They've exempted lots of the pipelines from inspection. Some of them are in western New York, where I live. The federal government will not reveal the precise locations of these. Now, if I were to go out and get a transit and a surveyor, I could figure out where they are from the official descriptions I thought, except it turns out the official description uses the proprietary measuring system of the pipeline company. So I can't really tell you where the exemptions are. 
Now, by the way, I should tell you that the Obama administration vigorously objects to my calling these exemptions or safety waivers. They say that's just totally unfair. But they do acknowledge that what they mean is you don't have to inspect. You could have a pipeline running right underneath your house. There are pipelines that run in front of schools. Well, the pipeline industry knows this. So every year, the pipeline industry sends to every school in America that has a pipeline running in front of a big pipeline, a six-page brochure. It's a beautiful color brochure, very well done. And it starts right off on the cover about what a great thing the pipeline industry is. And it's like that ad you may have seen for fracking on TV with the lovely woman in the blue dress. America's pipeline is the world's largest infrastructure bringing heat to your home. If you read through all this PR that most people would just toss in the trash to page five, it suddenly says, you as a principal are receiving this notice because your school is located in a high consequence area. Does it then say, here are the resources available if there's an explosion, here are the burn centers, here are the places? No, none of that. So a lawyer in the Midwest who discovered this filed free information acts because the pipeline companies have to have safety plans. Well, they got the safety plans. They were so cheaply cut and pasted you could see the lines on the photocopy machine. <laughs> they listed the names of fire departments that don't exist or who changed their phone numbers. And they just minimally mentioned what's there. And since I exposed both of these, oh, by the way, one more thing, the safety waivers I was telling you about, well, I read them and I went to school and we had diagram sentences. And I said, this doesn't say what it appears to say. They mean to say you can let the pipeline wear through 28% through the wall, 72% remaining. And they do it by estimating, the way engineers do. But what it actually literally says is you can let it wear through 72% when 28% is remaining. I sent this to a leading uh, professor who works in this field who called me back and he said, oh yeah, you're right, that's exactly what it says. He says, you know, that's true of all the nuclear power plants and their licenses. I've, I've written lots of reports on this all over the country. These things are written backwards. So I called the pipeline company. I told them about this. They said they didn't know what I was talking about. I called them again. I called the federal government. They won't call me back. The Obama administration will not call me back on this because one of their policies is that they don't like the question, they don't answer. They're worse than Bush on this. My book points out that if one of these pipelines in western New York ever explodes, my book becomes a full employment act for some lawyer to collect. All throughout our society, the rules that affect business are being rewritten. Insurance companies are getting rules that say we don't have to pay claims or we can pay claims at a deep discount. They're so strongly worded that a lawyer for Nationwide said to the Supreme Court of Mississippi, we wouldn't pay a dime. And the justice leans over and says, I'm sorry, I want to make sure I heard you correctly. Did you just say Nationwide wouldn't pay a dime? And the lawyer says, we wouldn't pay a dime. Many of you are lawyers. I'm sure won't be surprised that I teach my students. I'm not a lawyer, by the way. My law school students. But that's a stupid way to answer the question. The right way to answer that question if you're a lawyer is, Your Honor, we will pay every dime we owe. But that's not what he said. That's how arrogant they are. We are changing these rules in a way that is allowing the rise of these monopolies. They are mining the body politic. They are moving jobs offshore. They are building up so much in profits at the top. America, those 2,600 companies are now sitting on $17,000 of cash or near cash for every man, woman, child in America. Apple alone, almost $500 per American. They can't invest it because they've destroyed so many jobs. They have cut so many wages that people can't afford to buy their products and services. And we are in a vicious downward cycle. 1966, the bottom 90% income has fallen back to the level the IRS data showed 1966. It's actually not. $59 in real terms. Not that you'd notice less than five bucks a month in your pay. $59. So let's count that $59 as one inch. 90% of Americans, their income after 45 years grew one inch. The top 10%, 
Their line goes through the ceiling of this building, up into the air, 163 feet. The top 1%, over 880 feet. But the real gains are all within the top 1%. The top 1% of the top 1%, that's Mitt Romney's at the bottom of this group. The top 1% of the top 1%, five miles. Today we've been watching part two of David K. Johnston's presentation at the First Unitarian Church on his topic, The Rise of the Monopolist, Why the Few Get Rich While Your Paycheck Shrinks. If you missed part one, go to populistdialogues.org. All our past programs are there for viewing. Don't forget that you can watch Populist Dialogues on YouTube. Go to youtube.com and search for Populist Dialogues. Click on the result with the Statue of Liberty icon to view all our shows and to subscribe. If you're watching on YouTube, maybe you can help us expand our viewership. Just contact your local public access station and see what is required for you to sponsor a weekly broadcast of our program. Most local programs and stations are looking for good material and welcome the suggestion. And they can pick up the programming at no cost to them at pegmedia.org. Populist Dialogues is a project of the Portland Alliance for Democracy. Learn more about us at afd-pdx.org and our Portland and our national organization at thealliancefordemocracy.org. Thank you for watching. I hope we'll see you again next week. Bye.